what is with you guys in the wig? It's not that big a deal. I think it looks lovely. Uh, welcome to Morals and Humans. The director of the, of the IMAX in the first two episodes uh, uh, is an incredibly talented gentleman, and, and we're so lucky to have him. Rule, will you come out? And say hello. be able to crowbar him out of another show onto this um, where he's been doing really magical work and that's Scott Buck and his incredible writing staff. Uh, now, now we uh, are going to introduce you to uh, the Inhumans. Uh, growing up, uh, my favorite Inhuman, and, and if you all go out and and find Amazing Adventures number nine in the back in the letter section. There's actually a letter from me uh, writing to uh, Stan and telling him what I thought the story ought to be, which says a lot about me. Uh, and, uh, and, and my favorite character was Triton, and he's Mike, if you'll come out. Uh, is Oron. If you read the comics, she's, uh, she kicks ass in the comics. And so uh, when Sonya first came in, we just said, well, she's going to have to play this part. So uh, Sonya, come on out. taken aback because through the whole show she's blonde and has the donut on the back of her head like in the comics uh, and when she comes out she's just not gonna look like that but you're not gonna be disappointed are you? Uh, so, uh, Isabel come out and, and, uh, and glad everybody meet you. She please trust me. cities and stuff, and he's incredibly powerful, and we're so lucky to have discovered Emmy, uh, and he's just somebody you're going to know, and, and again, uh, be truly delighted by. Uh, Emmy, come on out, he plays Gorgon. in the show, I could only just see Ken in the part, so, uh, Ken, come on out. Uh, when you're gonna cast Maximus the Cunning, uh, not necessarily Maximus the Mad, uh, although he might be, um, look, you know him even better than we did when we first started out, and, and uh, it's been just an incredible pleasure uh, working with Awan.
she is our queen. Uh, you saw her very briefly. Uh, she has the responsibility for uh, about 40 pounds of hair uh, that, that will move and be wonderful and be a CG element. Uh, and, and is an extraordinary actress and, and handled the drama and the comedy and uh, uh, just ladies and gentlemen, Sarinda Swan, please introduce her. So you go to an actor and you say to an actor, uh, this is a great chance to play one of those iconic characters in Marvel. Uh, this character is over 50 years old, he's a king, he's regal, it's unbelievable, and uh, by the way, there's no lines. Uh, and, and, and guess what, there's never going to be any lines. Uh, it's not like we're going back in time and you're going to get to do it some other way or there's a magic surgery or anything else like that. Um, and, and I can tell you, as the character that he plays, the acting that he does, uh, just blew us all away. And yeah, I did say that. Uh, <laughs> Anson now plays Black Bolt. Some of this, how many for you is, this is your first Comic-Con? I want to talk with you guys first. So, Rule, like, you got this, this gig largely because you were insane enough to agree to go to Hawaii, and you're all sitting there going, oh yeah, Hawaii, oh, I do that. Um, but uh, if you shoot in the jungle in Hawaii for four months, uh, you might have a different opinion. Um, what, uh, it's so lush and beautiful. Uh, the, uh, the, tell us just a little bit about, like, working with the cameras and trying to get to make something that has that size and scope. Yeah, first of all, shooting in IMAX kind of scared everybody, you know, because I thought IMAX cameras were still like big refrigerators, but um, they have new digital ones, and we, I think we borrowed them from Avengers, right? So uh, before I was involved, I wanted to test them out, so I brought a IMAX camera to a testing facility in Los Angeles, and I was throwing it around, and the people of IMAX they were so scared, showing me, show, throwing this thing around. And then the funny thing, I asked them if they had any wider lenses, because I felt the lenses were not wide enough for this scope that we are trying to do. So they built a special lens for us for this show. And when you see this, this thing that we did on IMAX, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling beautiful. Uh, so, uh, Scott, like, this is a whole lot of people with superpowers. Were you doing a superpower show? Is that what you set out to do when we first sat down? No, I, I think the, the best approach for a show like this is just not to see these people as superheroes, but as people or inhumans who happen to have a superpower. And as you people watch the show, they will see that these superpowers are not always necessarily an asset and sometimes can actually be a crutch that they've depended on their whole lives to be able to solve their problems and then the story that we've created, uh, those superpowers are not necessarily always that helpful. Uh, no, it, it, it's one of the things that I, I got so caught up in uh, was this idea that uh, the people that lived in Adelan um, were very loyal to Bolt, uh, but in some ways uh, were not necessarily happy in that world. and, and a1, that's something that's Maximus, you got a chance to sort of take advantage of, I think, is a good way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool that after the discussions with you and Scott to try and make something slightly different with Maximus and sort of try to show the side of him that he's trying to genuinely change the world and um, <laughs> trying to help out the people who he believes are, uh, are living in, in terrible conditions in the caste system which they had no choice over, so he believes that he should uh, free them. And um, yeah, so that's where you get the conflict between the brothers. And he believes 
that his brother's not doing anything, so he, he needs to um, he needs to do something himself. And um, yeah, so that's where we kind of find Maximus in this one. So as you were saying earlier, he's kind of maybe perhaps more of an antagonist than a villain. Um, but yeah, it's just two opposing ideas. There are no clear sort of villains in Marvel, I think, because you have such um, interesting uh, shades for every character. And the idea was that he's just a passionate politician who wants to change things for the better, for the people, and maybe for himself. Now, Alan, you play the Silver Surfer in this, so that's a <laughs> role for you. Is, did you have to learn to surf while we were out there? Yeah, I did really quickly, though. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Natural talent. Well, I don't, maybe you're not playing the Silver Surfer. We'll get back. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Sonia, uh, as I told everybody, you got to kick ass. Tell me about what that, what was that like? Were you having fun? Yeah, it was a blast. We, um, Mike and I got great stunts and stunt training and worked with some amazing stunt um, choreographers and fight choreographers. And I had to take some serious boxing lessons and learn how to punch properly. And yeah, I remember in my audition, you guys asked me, are you athletic? And I'm like, yeah, yes I am. But <laughs> this role required much more than I anticipated. But um, it was a lot of fun. And you know, fighting in the jungle with full body of Lip, like covered in leather, that takes a lot of energy, and it was um, hard, but worth it. So I hope you guys enjoy our fun action scenes out there in the jungle. And uh, Mike, I, I don't think they know. Okay, you actually can kick ass. I mean, you play Triton, uh, and so you get a lot of fun doing that. But can you just tell them uh, uh, some of the titles that you hold that? Uh, uh, one or done or <laughs> I've, been doing, uh, I've been doing taekwondo since I was 12. Um, I'm a five-time world champion. I have my own school, so being able to do some action in the show and actually do it legitimately is is something that I'm very proud of. And this team, like Sonia just mentioned, she she kicks some serious butt, and everybody, whether they're trained like me or not, uh, you guys are gonna be really happy with the action. So. Isabel, you got to play, really, the princess in the story, uh, and a lot of your scenes were by yourself, but they weren't by yourself, because you were with a 2,000 pound bulldog. Yes. Uh, so, I, tell us what that was like when we told you that, that most of your scenes were with uh, a CGI character that we were going to put in the show. Yeah, it was very interesting because a lot of the time I'm just acting to the air. So I had to make up a, a great relationship with Lockjaw. But if you watch me from the outside on the day, you're like, what is this girl doing? She's crazy. But the, the funniest part is in my audition, at the end of my audition, I got asked to, you know, pretend that there was a huge giant head in front of me. And at this point, I didn't know that Crystal was going to, you know, talk to Lockjaw. So I, in my audition, I just started to like go crazy and like play with this invisible creature which I had no idea what it was. And then when I got the role, I was like, oh my gosh, I get why I was running around in the room, like acting to the air. And that was a lot of what my, what I did throughout the show. It was really fun and every day it was different and remembering where to look, when to look and just feeling the relationship with him. It was, it was good. I liked it. You still insisted on makeup, so uh, how many hours were you in that, and, and what was that like, and, and tell uh, us folks a little bit about playing Triton. So, I would have uh, three to five hours in the chair every morning, and uh, you know, Mike Smithson and the special effects makeup team, they are, number one, they're really cool guys, so it was really uh, a fast process, and you know, it was time to just kind of zone in for what was going to go on that day, and uh, we blast some music and uh, it was a lot of fun. So it's definitely not comfortable. It's something you have to get used to. And we had to do a life cast. So a couple weeks before the shoot, they covered me in goop. And it was a crazy experience. But um, yeah, some, some things that my martial arts training, the Zen and the focus helped me get, get through. So it's a lot of fun. And sometimes I had to look in the mirror and say like, oh, I would surprise myself. And then I'd get done with the day and take off my makeup. And everybody would be like, who are you? <laughs> I totally forgot yeah. what you looked like. I didn't tell you who you were when I first saw you on set. 
Uh, Ellen's, let, let's just, we'll just tell them. You think now? Yeah, we'll tell them. Are you sure? Uh, yeah, we are. I, look, part of, and it's been fun, and but obviously the Silver Surfer joke went over so well, I'm going to keep doing them. Uh, so I thought we'd jump ahead. Uh, the, this is not a big secret, guys. Uh, we just wanted to let folks know um, the, the beauty of the show is that the people that are the fish out of water are the heroes of our show. And so they come to Earth, uh, they're not really prepared, they are being hunted, uh, and uh, they make a friend. And they make a friend in a character named Louise, uh, who is an original character uh, that is uh, from Earth, uh, but has some special knowledge. And Ellen, what was it like being uh, I think literally the only person in the cast that didn't have powers. Well, thanks, Jeff, for rubbing that in. <laughs> We've talked about that, okay? Um, no, it was, uh, it was great. I mean, uh, for my character, I feel like there was a, um, a sort of levity that uh, that was there in, in the material and in the script that I really enjoyed doing, and so that sort of made up for not getting to have super powers, which I... I'm determined to maybe one day get, but, you know, season one. Uh, yes, we, we have, uh, we, we've decided we're going to do a, a half-hour sitcom called Jeez Louise. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it just has Ellen in it, talking to no one. Uh, to myself. <laughs> that, that should go 100 episodes for sure. Uh, so there you go, you got a big scoop. Anson, when you and I first started talking about playing this role, uh, as I teased you earlier on, um, you know, we told you that there was not going to be any dialogue, and, and oddly enough, that was what intrigued you the most. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you came to the role, and then, and then ultimately the, the language that you use that you only share with uh, Medusa? Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I couldn't have imagine ever coming across this acting challenge again. And so I really wanted to leap at it. And Jeff, being the very smart man he is, knew what I would ask for and he immediately offered to help find me help within the, the linguistics and signing community. Um, and I was very, I wanted to take it very seriously and not just at face value. So I, I knew that I was going to begin by learning how sign systems work. I started watching not just signers, but um, orchestra conductors. And I started building a lexicon. But I think what helped me the most is having a collaborator who <laughs> took it as seriously as I did and um, asked for me to send her videos of my homework. So I was like, oh, I guess I need to do my homework. Uh, and I think that Sarinda and I work very well in that capacity. I couldn't have done it without her, definitely. Now, I, Sarinda, you had the other half, which is which we don't exactly see in that scene, but when Bull speaks to the rest of them, you are the one who has to translate uh, for everyone else. So uh, what was it like? I mean, I, as those of us who saw the scripts, you you saw what he was seeing, saying, but it didn't. Yeah. You didn't know the physical manifestation of how that was going to happen. No, it was basically a, a scene. Where I, I would look at the scenes and I go, "There's his part and there's my part," and then I realized I had to say both parts. And so it was it was really interesting because um, the duality of that. Because if you, normally you're used to playing off somebody and somebody's emotions, and that's again, you know, I think we work so well together because there was so much emotion that I could see from you that I could get that it was easy on my side, but then I have to also be able to say it so that other people can understand it. So it was, it was, it was much easier when, in like the scene you just saw, when I'm speaking for him to everyone else because that's how it goes. But if it's like a, a more intimate scene between the two of us, I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> That's it. And so it's a really, it was, it was a challenge, but it was a, an amazing challenge to learn. And, and yeah, he would send me the videos and we would sync them. So it's not just, as I've said before, it's not him just doing like hand puppets and I'm talking. We have it synced. So if we went off the sync, we would stop the scene. So I know the words. And that if you pay attention throughout the whole um, show, you'll start to recognize words and moments. And so when he speaks, um, I will 
I'll be looking at it through my periphery and there's a really interesting relationship that you guys might catch because I don't always say what he signs word for word. That's one of the best things about Medusa, she's got a strong opinion. Um, and so you'll see us kind of having this interesting grind as we communicate and the relationship that's there. You know, it's obviously husband and wife, king and queen, and also I play as interpreter. So it's a really, it, it, it was a, such a fun role to try to, uh, to figure out, but I couldn't have obviously done it without you either. It was, yeah, the, our videos were amazing. <laughs> and, and Hanson, we obviously were, were very sensitive to the deaf community and, and not in any way saying that we were doing signing. We, this was a language which Bolt created so that he could communicate specifically with Medusa. Yeah, I, 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 I actually even checked uh, my signs against ASL more often than not to make sure that nothing was overlapping, but I did, I worked with a, an uh, ASL consultant to learn sort of what were the, um, some of the underlying rules of ASL that make it more efficient, and, uh, and that helped a, a, a lot. Yeah. Uh, Rule, I, one of the things that you can definitely see, in, at least in those, those first two sequences, is, is just the, the scope. I mean, in one case, you were out in the jungle, and in the other case, you were on one of our sets. How did you approach that, that the, the particular look of what it is that we had, and then particularly when we started to talk about set design, that you had a vision that, that I think really helped sell the story in terms of the grandeur of the palace, and, Obviously, that's just one room. You, there's a whole city that you guys cannot believe what it looks like. Yeah, no, you, you are looking at all the movies that are out there and seeing what works on IMAX and what doesn't work on IMAX. And then you need to also realize that we're making television. So it was a kind of a mix between, okay, we need to design sets that have skill also in height and where we can move the camera forward instead of sideways. So you see a lot of movements of the camera, also something that I really like. I like scope, I like move the camera. But we're moving the camera in a different way than we normally see on television to kind of give you the feeling of going into this world, revealing the things that are cool to see. And uh, I think we did a wonderful job, and the art department did a wonderful job building this massive set that are hugely high and that are like 360 degrees visible in all sizes, so I could really be low angle with the, uh, with the actors to show the scope of this whole thing. It was a, it was a blast. Uh, Emmy, you, this was, this was a, like a new thing. Like this was, I remember when you came in, you, this was, you got all excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me what it was like to find out that you were, you were going to play Gorgon and that you were going to be wearing these clothes and, and that I, and this personality, which in so many ways is you. I mean, I, I think everybody so here is so sort of the kind of, of lovable and yet sometimes very angry and dangerous person that you can be. Uh, tell us about that. Um, it was kind of cool because playing Gorgon, it actually kind of had a way of expressing myself and actually discovering stuff about myself as well. Like during filming, I would. I would kind of just go around town and I realize, like, I'm doing very Gorgonic things. <laughs> and uh, I'd be like, it, it, was, it was such a, a, a great discovery. This guy's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, having the opportunity to consistently just act off of impulse uh, is very exhilarating. Everyone should try it. Um, so, you know, discovering more about him, especially the fact of the size and the scope, and it made me realize a lot that I have no idea my own strength. Um, oh my gosh, you guys, he hurts people. I, I, I really do. Like, I'm if not. you ever hug this man, it is one of the most painful, if yeah. you see any time I have to hug him, my hand goes out first. <laughs> it's like, buffer him coming at me. Like, on the screen as well. He's he just hugged me backstage and got welts. Yeah. Yeah. We're not joking. Like, this is, for he is the most aggressive hugger you will ever meet. I like, if you like aggressive hugs, hug him. I like how Emmy said he took on being, what was your describing? Uh, Gorgonic. Gorgonic. Yeah, because he really Hashtag. did. So, when we first met, I, I said to him, I dare you to chest press me. And he was like, all right. So the last night on set, um, 
I lay like really straight like a board and Emmy chest pressed me and I'm thinking like maybe like eight or ten times. It's like we're up to 34 and I'm just getting chest pressed by Emmy. It was yeah, amazing. Yeah. And it's not that I stopped. I actually just was realizing like I can do this all day. For real. <laughs> seeing Mike Moe as Triton with an <laughs> iPhone and then these people on the ground. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, just walk into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if, if Emma and, and, and Gorgon are completely acting on impulse, uh, sort of the, the yin and the yang or, or in, in many ways uh, the relationship in, in of mice and men, uh, Ken, when, when you got the role of Karnak and we explained to you that, uh, you know, not in addition to being advisor of the king and someone who can sort of see the world, uh, both half empty and half full simultaneously, um, that you had to look after this guy. Uh, tell us what it was like playing Karnak. Um, it was daunting. I mean, the character is so formidable, physically, intellectually, and spiritually, um, that I'm constantly challenged by being in a position to to play him. Um, so I love. I've never felt that before, where I'm kind of constantly catching him, trying to catch him, and it stretches me. And, you know in ways that uh, I'm not used to. So with Emmy, it's great. I think with us, we started just a very casual debate over what is your favorite superpower very early on. I won. Um, I, think it's, I think it's still ongoing. And my position was that, you know, I, I not only do, do I want to fly, I think, Really, everyone does, no matter what their answer is, and that started like this thing. Yeah, but it's, the fact is, you're super strong. Here we go. <laughs> We've heard you can get an object, all day, all day, all day, all day. and thrust yourself into the air, which right. makes you fly. Right, right. And also, if you do fly, if you do fly, and you land on the ground, you're not strong enough for a proper landing, and you can die. If you're a terrible just in response to how we're different. No. <laughs> anyway, we talked about it a little bit before about how we don't really see Maximus as the villain, but I, I mean, I think a lot of people know you from the, that other television show. Uh, you're the people down here. Uh, you, you, had, you had a lot of concerns, you bastard. Uh, so, uh, how did you come to terms with that, uh, and, and when you came on board, you know, tell us about Maximus. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, again, it was, um, my, my fear was that, um, because of, the, I looked into who this Maximus guy was, and it was like, oh, he looks like I'm doing the same thing again, I don't really, I, you know, it's that fear of being typecast, and that you, you just end up doing, you know, doing, just repeating myself and playing, but then, as we discussed it more and more, I realised that that wasn't at all what we were trying to create in this show, and um, and your enthusiasm and vision um, really kind of inspired me actually to kind of think, well, I think we can make something really interesting from this character and tell the story from from a, a different perspective of of, of this, this young man who um, you know he went through his terogenesis and he became uh, nothing and. Um, you know, in, in this society, which is all about what power you have, to be where he is, he's the lowest of the low, and he kind of, he, you know, he's kind of out, and the only reason he's really not working down the mines is because he's the brother of the king, and even though he, and he believes he would make a much better king because he can talk to the people, he's a man of the people, and you know, he had, you know, it's this, and you see there in that clip that there was some you know, friendship in his past with, 
Medusa, which he feels that he kind of lost and he's become sort of ignored really um, by everyone. So that kind of motivates his kind of want to, um, to further himself as well as saving the people that he feels so sorry for. Um, so yeah, in, in a way he is a revolutionary um, and a forward thinker and he thinks that he can genuinely change the world for the better for the people. Um, yeah, I think that's probably kind of where we, where we find him in this series. But then, you know, and he's ruthless. If he, he believes that in order to make this happen, these are the things that he has to do. And he doesn't like it, he loves his family. Um, you know, they're the only family he has and it's a lonely world. Um, but, you know, his, his uh, sort of belief in what he's doing and that he, he thinks it's right. And when you, you know, when you hear what he's saying, it, it, it is right, you know, and, and um, he's just trying to stop suffering. Um, so yeah, and then, you, you know, the, the, the cost of the decisions that he makes really starts to, like, corrupt him. It, it's a very Shakespearean sort of story, like a sort of, you know, quite Macbeth-type vibe. So that's why I really wanted to do it. <laughs> in a, does that make any sense? I think. Um, <laughs> And, and Serena, you really get caught sort of in the middle of all this. And now you are literally the woman between the two brothers, not just sitting up here, but... Uh, but and, and I think one of the things that we talked about from the very beginning is how important it is that Medusa isn't just an extension of Bolt. And how did you bring that to the character? Well, one, it was already on the page. I think that's what Marvel does so well, is that there's such strong female characters, and so as soon as you know you're going to be a part of Marvel, um, you know you're taken care of. Uh, so that was incredible right off the bat. And there was just an insistence as we were going through it, was even in the dialogue, but also in, in you know, the whole uh, plot points, was that she wasn't just going to be this interpreter. And as I said before, you see those moments where she challenges him, where she changes his words a little, where she's not willing to just stand behind him. Um, and so that was from the beginning. I mean, even from the audition, uh, it was very apparent. Even, I mean, we, we have no idea what we're auditioning for at all in any capacity. Um, with imaginary signs that disappear in 24 hours. It's very ominous and very <laughs> scary when you're walking in. And so we were in the audition process, and at the end, you know, I was going in for, I think it was Margie. Um, and <laughs> couldn't be farther from who she is. And I'm going in for Margie, and at the end, Jeff is in the room, and he goes, I want you to just, just finish it by saying, but remember, I am your queen. And I got all these goosebumps, and I was like, I don't know who she is, but I love Margie. She's amazing. Where does she come from? Um, and that was sort of the insistence from day one, from being in the room. It was just this presence that she had to have. Um, and that started from the audition, and then it just continued with every script that I saw. So uh, that, was, that was amazing to come into.